Hey, hey everyone, welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Dhanapani. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. I hope all of you are staying safe and all of you are good wherever you're at. And uh, in uh, today's webinar, we're going to discuss the mid-year report on the national and state recycling policy at the United States. We have Megan Quinn, who's a reporter at Waste Dive, who's moderating this webinar. This is the first webinar that Megan is uh, moderating for Be Waste Wise. In the past, we've had Cole from Waste Dive, who's moderated and who's been a panelist on our uh, webinars, which you can find when you go to the video panel section of our website. Uh, Megan is going to talk to uh, Sarah Edwards, who's a director at Unomia Research and Consulting. She will also speak to Yinka Bode George, who's an environmental health manager at NCEL. Uh, as usual, we have received your questions. We pass the questions on to the panelists, and uh, they're going to incorporate that in the conversation. Uh, please remember to, if, if you have any other questions, please remember to use the Q&A section. Put your questions out there. Megan will ensure she picks it up as and when it is relevant to the conversation. And uh, take it up with the panelists. So over to you, Megan. Great. Thanks so much for having us. And I'm really excited to uh, learn a lot from this conversation today. Um, I wanted to start with Yinka, since you, uh, your expertise is sort of in this US state policy and uh, all this, the policies that kind of vary um, from region to region. I'm curious sort of this legislative season, what trends you're seeing, if there are any particular bills that are really rising to the top for you that sort of um, are notable this year. Yes, thanks. First, thanks for inviting me. This is such a great opportunity to chat with you all. Um, there is a lot happening. <laughs> I'm going to do my best to be succinct, but honestly, uh, this has been a tremendous year for zero waste policy. Um, so I'll just start by saying, um, so the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, or NCEL, we're a state organization of, of legislators, a, a national organization of state legislators, and we work to inform, inspire, and facilitate state-level action um, focused on environmental policy through a lens of justice. Um, so we work with legislators to shift away from our culture of single use and promote a culture of product circularity, particularly at the onset of design. We also push for environmental justice consciousness because waste issues are environmental justice issues. Um, plastic pollution, for example, has extensive ecological and health consequences, and the burdens are disproportionately on Black, Brown, and other communities of color in our country. Um, and I think it's so important to note the way that COVID um, and the pandemic has shaped this proliferation of zero waste practices and policies. Um, you know, at the onset of the pandemic, we saw attempts to repeal um, existing single use bans um, at the state level and things like that, because some folks had fears that um, not having these single use plastic materials and you know, using reusables would sort of spread um, bacteria and the viruses, but that has been really dispelled. And um, we had a lot of legislators step up and work against that, recognizing that a lot of these issues that we're seeing, um, thinking about the pandemic, thinking about waste issues are interconnected. Um, we saw a lot of studies that draw drew comparisons um, or associations between folks who had the burdens of air pollution due to things like waste incineration in their communities. Um, they actually were more susceptible to the pandemic and COVID-19. Um, and, and it's things like that that made folks say, you know, we can't just limit our perspectives on waste issues to the ecological impacts. We have to account for human health impacts. Um, and, I, and I think that sort of intersectional thinking um, allowed a lot of legislators to lean into the importance of um, strengthening recyclability and um, waste management practices. Um, and so we saw so many bills this year, and that's so great. So this year across the country, um, we saw a variety of zero waste policies um, to comprehensively tackle plastic pollution. And while this is a conversation about recycling policy, it's so important to recognize that recycling strategies must be coupled with things like source reduction, reuse and refill strategies, um, and toxic protection policies to be effective. So I'm gonna cover four main groups of policies we've seen this year, source reduction, um, PFAS and packaging, recycled content, and producer responsibility. So this, 
session alone, there have been over 90 bills introduced banning or restricting the sale of single use plastic items, as well as 17 bills addressing PFAS and packaging have been introduced, furthering hazardous substance protections for our communities, and over 60 bills aiming to strengthen recyclability through recycled content mandates. Uh, and finally, nine states have introduced bills this year to establish extended producer responsibility programs for packaging products. So I'll highlight five noteworthy bills so you all can get a sense um, and have examples of what these policies really entail. So in Washington state, there's SB 5022. Um, it creates a minimum recycled content for plastic beverage containers, household cleaning and personal care bottles and jugs and trash bags. It also prohibits the sale of styrofoam food service products like coolers oh, and coolers, packaging peanuts and things like that. Um, and it makes plastic serviceware, so things like straws and utensils, available upon request. Um, so that's in Washington. In Colorado, H1162 phases out single-use plastic bags, polystyrene cups and containers, and reverses a law that prohibited municipalities from taking action around plastic pollution. And that is a major, major aspect um, that I think will be a great model for other states to follow. Um, and in Maine, there's LD5041. It's an extended producer responsibility for packaging bill that would increase um, effective recycling by requiring producers of packaging products to cover the cost of, um, of managing those products and recycling them, and also tasking them with better designing the products to, so that they can be more recyclable. In Vermont, there is H there's House Bill 175, um, which strengthens Vermont's existing bottle bill program. This bill doubles the types of bottles covered by our their existing bottle bill, um, including wine bottles, water bottles, and it increases the deposit from five cents to 10 cents. It also increases the handling fee for non-commingled bottles. And finally, in Minnesota, there's House Bill 79, which bans food packaging products that contain PER and polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFAS. So if you don't know, PFAS is a class of chemicals known for heat resistance and the ability to repel water, grease, and oils. Um, they've been associated with degrading health, so it's very important to eliminate their use in packaging products and other materials so we don't keep recycling back hazardous substances in our consumer products. So I will stop there. As you see, like there's so much going on this year, and it's a very exciting time for zero waste strategies. That's great. Uh, thanks so much for that overview. Um, well, very succinct uh, for how much is happening. Um, and I do want to end up going back and kind of getting into some of the nitty gritty of a few of these bills. But um, before we do that, I also want to kind of put it into a national context as well, and maybe an international context since um, I know Sarah's work is both um, in the US and also abroad. So I'm curious, Sarah, for you, of these bills that you are hearing now, um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, uh, what you think in terms of opportunities for these bills to have a national impact, even though these are state bills, are you seeing any trends that you think are going to come up sort of on a, on a more national scale? Oh, Sarah, I think you're muted. Thank you. Um, yeah, obviously, um, you know, we're already seeing some traction and some um, some movement at a federal level. And I think some of the states have actually looked potentially to the Break, Break Free from Plastic Act, actually, for some guidance. And that, you know, that act does has a whole suite of measures from extended produce responsibility to address the plastic um, carrier bags, as well as as obviously um, DRS or deposit refund systems for, for beverages. So I think there is some traction there already. I think, um, you know, in the past, we've always seen seen that states have to effectively um, look to policy that might work in their in their legislative environment and, and each state has a different process for, for pushing and passing legislation so there's always a small amount of horse trading that has to be done I think from our perspective I mean you know me uh, prides herself on basically supporting uh, states and, and 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 industry effectively looking at data to, to, to provide you know data driven um, um, options and, and and guidance and I've in from a policies perspective I think it's it's key to try and keep 
policy as simple as possible. So from the outset, what do you actually want to achieve from this bill? And, you know, for instance, in Maine, you might look at the extended producer responsibility bill. And they, you know, from, from my perspective, from, from the outside slightly, you know, they were looking at how do we cover the cost of of, of packaging at the end of its life. Um, from from other bills are looking at more about how can we kind of drive up recycling and increase recycling rates. So simplicity is key, but knowing what you, what you want is key from the bill is, is imperative. So from our perspective, we want to ensure that the least amount of packaging results, um, you know, ends up in our environment and that we create a, a, the right market conditions to enable um, those packaging materials to have recycled content, for instance, so that they, we, we create a market to drive investment in the infrastructure. So from our perspective, we think targets are key. Target Whether that's targets on minimum recycled content, whether that's targets on the amount of packaging that needs to be recycled, and those targets need to be clearly assigned to the producers that are placing that packaging on, on the market. Um, and what we're seeing, I think, at the moment is a little bit of a lack of um, um, pushback on producers in terms of making sure that they are responsible for the packaging they place on the market and meeting those targets. And I think that's going to be key, strengthening up, in terms of the national bill, strengthening up the ownership of meeting those targets and demonstrating those targets is going to be key if we really do want to have, you know, zero waste policies implemented across the, across the country. Um, and, and I think the other, the, the other point is that we are seeing a little bit of, um, you know, different policies across the state, which means that in terms of compliance, um, for instance, you know, producers could use the same data to comply with requirements in one bill as they use in an, in, an, in another in another state, which means we're not actually going to get more investment in the infrastructure we need, just effectively double counting of the same data. So I think from a national perspective, some of those um, aspects need to be taken into consideration um, and learned from as we try and hopefully put together something at a national level. Cool. Yeah. That, uh, thanks for that perspective. I think you brought up an interesting point about, yeah, you know, every state is going to do it a little differently and have maybe different priorities and targets. Um, and that made me think of um, these EPR bills that are um, in play. So I'm curious from both of your perspectives, um, you know, Yinka brought up the um, EPR for packaging bill in Maine. And then I know there's some other ones that didn't quite make it, one in New York. So I'm curious sort of what the um, the outlook you think is for maybe the main bill and then also why, you know, what you think it might take to pass some of these similar EPR for packaging bills in the future, since we already in the US have similar ones for maybe mattresses and things like that. And it's just not as common here, at least to have um, that type of um, policy for our, our plastic packaging. So yeah, I'm just curious what your outlook is on that. I mean, I think, um... I do think I, I mean I, I do think some of the bills, as I said, could be stronger in terms of actually achieving some recycling increase in recycling rate. I think we would be remiss, and I, you know, I always look to some of the deposit um, bills that we've had, obviously for you know thirty odd years, um, and they they were there to obviously protect and reduce litter, and was one of one of the first recycling kind of programs. But they don't have any targets in them, or any 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 penalty based targets in, in them. So they don't actually achieve what they could achieve. And I have a I'm a little bit concerned that some of the EPR policy is effectively going to pay enable our existing system to be paid for, but not necessarily the system that we need um, in, the, in the country. So I think that's what I would like um, states to be a little bit more robust and use the data that's available to them to say, like, even if that, even if the transition to EPR is slightly longer in the fact that in year one, you have to report on, you know, on, on what you're placing on the market in year two, you need to make sure that you gather data to demonstrate what is actually and isn't actually being recycled in the state. And then year three, the targets start to sit, to, you know, to, to step in and maybe they start relatively low and then they phase up. But if without that target and that increasing target, we're just going to effectively maintain the status quo. Um, and that, that's my concern. Inka, what, what do you, what is your perspective on that? Yeah, so I, thanks Sarah, that's so great. Um, I think that there's a lot here. One of the things that I think would be really key in, in pushing these bills through is 
honestly conveying the idea of EPR. I think a lot of legislators are still wrapping their heads around how exactly these strategies are implemented, connecting to existing EPR programs. So yeah, as you said, Sarah, there's there's been um, bottle return policies that are actually producer responsibility programs and other existing models. Um, so yeah, this year we saw a lot of states introduce bills for the first time. And I think um, thinking like a legislator, for a lot of them, it was really just like a, a campaign year, an education year for their own respective legislatures so that um, in subsequent years, they can add some meat to, to their strategies. Um, I know a lot of advocates are working with legislators to inform their strategies, great folks like Sarah and others um, to, to make their strategies more complex, to insert source reduction um, targets and um, requirements in these EPR models. Um, but also to sort of create a spectrum of policy solutions that legislators can couple their EPR programs with, right? So as we said, you can't just do one, you can't just focus on recycling. There is no way we can recycle our way out of this waste crisis we're currently in. We have to start at the source reduction piece, right? And consider those opportunities and avenues as we're considering what we're doing with existing um, post-consumer products. So I think it, there's a lot here, um, but but I, I personally feel that in, in the coming years and coming sessions, legislators will be working closely with advocates, but also with one another. I think a lot of folks have their eyes on Maine right now um, because that bill is certainly pushing its way through that legislature. Um, and I think it, it, in a lot of ways, it will set the tone for other EPR packaging programs in the country. Um, but also I think a lot of legislators are considering other opportunities. So thinking about the Washington bill I spoke about about um, the, the recycled content um, components of this work. Um, it, it's so critical to think about all of these solutions hol holistically. Um, but also when we think about um, EPR programs, especially for these the Northeast states that are very tiny and close together, um, it's so critical to harmonize strategies um, because they're gonna be leaning on each other for the material recovery processes. So it's one thing that we do at NCEL is pull legislators together so that they can have conversations across the country with one another um, and attempt to harmonize their programs so that they are working together. Um, so that's right off the top of my head, that's what I think we should be thinking about. Yeah, I think regional harmonization is 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 critical. I mean, you know, we know that the materials that are collected at the curbside or through other systems, are, they're global commodities. And so we need to think about not obviously what we want to do is try and build the infrastructure and recycling infrastructure and, and processing in, in North America and in, in the US specifically. But we have to recognize that you know, it's very difficult for a small state that's producing a relatively small amount of recycled goods to, to have very specific policies to, to them when, when producers are manufacturing their goods across the whole of the, the US. So regional harmonization is key and that's something that we're actually working on with an organization called Reloop just specifically for the de deposit systems in the Northeast. So trying to look at how we harmonize those programs and, and enable um, other states to potentially implement um, um, deposit systems as well. I think on, um, I think clearly, you know, we, there's two stages. There's obviously getting the bill developed and passed, and then there's a kind of the rulemaking and art, and the art piece afterwards, which can be just as tricky as almost getting the bill passed. And I think we do need to be mindful about what, um, how much guidance we can maybe put in the bill to enable the flexibility in the rulemaking process so that you know the department's environmental protections can build those, those that rulemaking up with us um to be as robust as possible to ensure that we do get the outcomes we want and the intended outcomes that the bill was there you know the attention of the bill when it was was developed so i think the rulemaking we can't just take it for effort off the gas effectively when the bill's passed potentially we need to make sure that when we're developing that bill we, we look to the rulemaking process to enable the flexibility for that for those guys um, in when they come to, to do that that piece. And the other thing I think we should look at specifically obviously in those the, the bill um, states that have deposit bills like we're looking to put through um, recycled content mandates but when you have a deposit system there's the effectability to you potentially use those bills to insert recycled content requirements. Um, so instead of necessarily trying to push through a new recycled content bill for, for plastic um, beverage bottles, you can use it, existing deposit um, 
bottle bill regulation to try and add in recycled content mandates um, and holding producers to account because most of them have made these con commitments already globally um, for recycled content. So we really should be holding them to account on those promises. I wanted to try to take a few audience questions as well. Um, and there's a lot of the, that have come in. Um, a couple um, kind of interesting ones have to do with the idea of, you know, what, how are these bills going to affect the end user? I think uh, specifically with EPR, I know that there's some concerns about, hey, is this going to cost me more money? Like, how is this going to change my day to day life? And I think as policy people, we like think so much about like how the bill gets written, how it gets passed, that um, there maybe isn't as much conversation about, you know, wh what this is going to look like day to day. So in terms of, um, I, I, would, I would frame this in terms of EPR specifically, but maybe some other ones that you think, what, what's sort of this um, impact on, on us, you know, as... Yeah, so I mean, we are already paying for, you know, at the waste, the, waste, the packaging that's placed on the market currently. So we we pay through our rates or, you know, for our taxes for, for that system. And, uh, and effectively, the evidence that we've shown is that when you look at the environmental, social and financial benefits of having extended producer responsibility, they far outweigh what could, you know, some people say that there's going to be a a, a push through of some of those costs back onto the, the products that we buy but in reality in the in the work that we've done we've seen no no statistical significant um outcomes in terms of the increase in price of goods and you know we've looked at we've looked at states across canada when they've introduced the, these types of bills and we have environmental econ economists that sit down and work through factors that affect uh, that can be seen as statistically proven to increase that price of goods and ex extended producer responsibility doesn't do that. What it will do effectively will make producers first of all think about how they are in a competitive environment, they're placing products on the market, will think how they try to minimize those costs under the system. So it comes back to waste reduction, looking at packaging design, looking at material, what materials they should be using in their packaging to ensure that they're more easily recyclable so that they reduce those costs. And as they are in a competitive environment, they'll be looking at how they can internalize some of those costs as well, because they're, you know, they have, they have a price point and they can't be pushing through 0.01 cent onto a product, which is effectively what you may if you did the math, potentially have as a push through. So they can't push that through onto a, onto a product. So as I said, the evidence that we've got through statistical analysis shows that there's no direct or statistical um, correlation between EPR and an increase in price, price of goods. And you know the increase of, of packaging and or, or the goods that we buy, it varies from where you live in the country, from what, what street you live in, from where, to where you shop. So um, th th there's not that, um, that correlation effectively um, and as I said it, the, the system is there to ensure that they look to minimize the main amount of packaging they're placed on the market to reduce their fees and look to how they can internalize some of those externalities but overall we need to think I think you know Yinka said to this like this isn't about just the environmental impact this is about the social impact this is about uh, you know other impacts and when you when the work we do looks at what the direct costs are to consumers as well as the indirect costs in terms of what what does it feel like to live in a littered environment what does it look like in terms of the price of, of property what does it look like on you know people living in environments that ha are unfairly um, impacted by some, some of this and so when we build in all of those externalities which is effectively what EPR is trying to do there you know there's overarching benefits to, to implementing these types of policies. Did you want to add on to that Inka at all? I don't have anything to add. I, <laughs> from what I have seen in research that it aligns perfectly I yeah echoing everything that Sarah said. <laughs> Um, we had a couple of questions specifically for you, Yinka, about um, sort of some of the policy, the positions that NCEL takes on um, some of the more national stuff. Uh, specifically, I mean, uh, are you uh, pushing a national bottle bill, for example, um, or some kind of um, harmonized uh, bill for, for EPR? So we are a nonprofit. We don't you know, push for specific bills. We work with our legislator members and resource them um, and educate them. <laughs> so you'll never see NCEL coming out with a formal um, sort of position on specific bills. Of course, we do have our own priorities and issues that we feel are great in terms of like 
a community health standpoint, you know, I lead our environmental health program. So for me, it's always a conversation about public health. So we do have principles. Um, and if a particular bill or strategy aligns with our like community health and environmental justice principles, we will help legislators um, strengthen, strengthen it. And that's basically how we look at issues. Um, I think when you think about these sort of national um, programs, while I think it's it's great that there are federal efforts pushing for EPR strategies, pushing for um, bottle bill strategies. I think it's also equally important that uh, state legislators and legislatures are activated um, and, and start sort of from the um, from the local level to build these programs up so that when federal efforts come, um, they're sort of aligned and harmonized. I think when we saw the, be, the Break Free Act reintroduced this year, one of the things that the lead sponsors kept saying were states have modeled the, the success of these programs already. That's exactly what we want to see. We want to see partnerships between state legislatures and, and federal efforts. That's, that's where we sit as an organization. Um, and yeah. Great. Um, another audience question that is great. I'm so glad uh, this person asked this because we've talked a lot about, um, you know, source reduction, you know, what we do with the materials, all of these different strategies, but we haven't talked about infrastructure yet. Um, her question is kind of about what the infrastructure ga gaps you both might be seeing um, and what those barriers might be to increasing recyclability. Um, and, and to her point in this question, um, MRFs appear to be running under capacity, but what about other elements in the value chain? So I'm just curious what both your thoughts are on that. I mean, I think there, um, I think obviously, I mean, pl plastics infrastructure, I suppose is, is one of the key and, you know, talking about flexible pack packaging and flexible plastics and, and the, the infrastructure necessary to recycle some of those um, uh, grades of plastic is going to be key. I, I think a lot of this require, it comes down to volume and, and the amount of material. So we come back a little bit back to kind of what can you do necessarily as a, as a maybe a relatively small state like Vermont versus what you can do regionally. And this is why harmonization of some of that EPR policy is, is going to be critical, because what you want is to have some regional infrastructure to, to pick up um, on some of the materials that aren't financially viable to collect necessary or process um, at, a, at a smaller scale within, within states. So I, I think, again, pushing back on the the requirement to meet targets and those targets being material specific will force producers to try and work with legislators to harmonize bills and to therefore then as producer responsibility organizations to ensure that sufficient infrastructure is in place. When we look at some some materials like PET, you know, the industry is there, the recycling industry is there, the mechanical recycling industry is there, they have capacity, their biggest problem is supply. If they can't get the supply, they can't get the clean supply that they need um, to supply the market that the market demands. So it comes back, not necessarily just to the infrastructure piece, but how do we collect sufficient quantities, both at the curbside and through deposit systems to enable those facilities to work at their, their capacity and then effectively meet some of these recycling content bills. I mean, I think one of the important things that's coming out, which is we have to try and address is that producers are saying they can't meet recycled content requirements because they don't have control over the infrastructure or the collection mechanism. And so we've got this kind of, you know, chicken, chicken and egg situation where they're pushing back because they, they can't source the material um, because they don't have control over the system. Um, and so we're getting some delay tactics that way. So from my perspective, if, you know, if you're a state that is looking to, to introduce um, minimum recycled content in beverage bottles will then give them the option under that bill to set up a producer responsibility organization to collect via a bottle bill so that you don't give them the out effectively um, of meeting those recycled content requirements. Um, but regional collaboration is necessary for, for big infrastructure that we're going to need to, to address some of the different specific plastic um, resin grades, definitely. Thanks, Sarah. That I... Great points. Um, you know, I think 
as we are having this discussion, one thing that um, I'm realizing we have not spoken enough about is the nexus with um, acting on climate change. Of course, we recognize that um, zero waste issues are huge climate issues as well, especially as you think about plastic materials um, and the extraction and refining process. The, um, the, the climate contributors there are immense. And then when you're incinerating these materials, it just you know, is is really bad for communities and the climate. Um, as we are having conversations about um, all of the necessary infrastructure for acting on climate, we cannot forget zero waste. Um, and so while there's a lot of opportunities that exist at the state level to build out infrastructure, I do think federal level partnerships are necessary um, for us to really win on great infrastructure. Um, we need to build out <laughs> the recovery processes. Um, there are certain states, I was in a conversation with um, wonderful legislators in Mississippi about their recycling programs and in some communities, the lack of recycling programs and how that's such a huge barrier um, for, for, munis for municipalities there, right? So I think um, leaning into a climate justice framework on these issues is so critical. And, um, you know, working with our federal partners to make sure that when huge infrastructure proposals are made, they also address and account for zero waste programs, so. Yeah, and it's, it's how you build flexibility into some of these bills. Um, you know, some of the complexities, for instance, of extended producer responsibility that we've been looking at in, in Europe for the European Commission is around, you know, how do fees, um, how, how a producer fees affected by whether you're putting a single use plastic bottle or glass bottle on the market versus refillable. So effectively, when you place that container on the market, if it's single use, every time you place a new container on the market, you're going to be paying into the system. If you put a reusable bottle, a refillable bottle on the market, then you effectively only pay for it once, but there's that bottle may, may last seven or eight circuits. So there's an incentive in terms of the fees that you pay by you by looking at other other models to, to effectively re reduce waste and we're we're seeing a lot of interest again in refillables um, but there's a huge infrastructure cost required to get those systems up, up and running as well so we need to be understanding some of these bills how we might leave the door open I suppose for change down the line as some of these principles again start becoming more viable, I suppose, financially, compared when the cost of EPR goes up significantly, then businesses will start looking at alternative delivery models. And, you know, some of the some of the legislation that's, sort of, for instance, been passed in France around the need for grocers to sell um, materials in loose and not necessarily packaged is going to look at, you know, we're going to have a huge amount of interest around dispensing models in in grocery stores and, and all these types of things are going to start coming up so it comes down to education as well and I know Ayinka is like so true and it's not just legislators actually the producers don't really know have any experience of this either they may be able to look to some of their counterparts in other jurisdictions in you know in Europe or in Canada but they are also learning so I mean it's it's a big learning curve for everyone but I, th I, I think we have to try and keep the door open as far as possible or have have the foresight that there may be something that we need to consider later down the line and, and not requiring an additional bill to incorporate refillables or other kind of waste reduction measures into that legislation. You both uh, spoke to this a little bit, but I, I want to um, get into this a little bit more. The, another audience question about um, EPR and content policies, um, how are they working with MRFs and smaller recyclers too? Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of packaging that can't be captured in the systems that are available, depending on where you live. And um, this person is curious about how these policies sort of address that lack of infrastructure and tech advances and sort of how to bring those, you know, MRF operators and recyclers kind of into that decision making process. I think, quite frankly, I don't think they've addressed it very well at all to date. <laughs> Um, because there is, um, as far as I see, there's a lot of what, what's being proposed is this, as you say, this kind of um, producers being required to pay for a system, but then 
there's no clarity on what system they're paying for and there's no clarity as to actually how some of that funds will flow through to some of these material recycling facilities in you know smaller villages and towns and and i think that's not known yet i think it comes back to my point around targets if you do not set high targets you're not going to get investment you're going to you're going to initially get investment in where you can get the biggest bang for your dollar effectively which is maybe supporting some of the larger infrastructure in some of the larger cities where there there is volume you're not going to get that cascading down to some of the more rural areas or, some, or the smaller communities where there also needs to be investment so from my perspective you need to have material specific targets that need to be escalating over time so that that you gradually get investment in every single community within the state not just necessarily where they're going to maximize the volume of material that's collected and that's some of the complexities that have um, been addressed in more recent years in Canada for instance and having also some requirements in to ensure that every household has the equivalent service to another. So whether you're living in a multifamily or a single family property, whether you're in an urban area or a rural area, you're, you, there's a minimum requirement of service that you're able to, that you're expected, and that will then allow investment as well in those regional um, or more local infrastructure. Yeah, I agree. And, and um, I just saw another comment in the chat about um, locations that don't even have um, recycling facilities. It's it's the, the stark reality, right? Um, and, and that's exactly why I'm saying as we're having conversations about huge infrastructure programs, we cannot leave out the zero waste considerations. Um, because you're right, there are folks, I'm thinking about um, the folks in Jackson, Mississippi right now, um, who, who are also experiencing a water crisis. And so as they were shipping single use plastic bottles to address the water needs, um, there is no recycling facility to recycle those bottles. Like that is a crisis. And that's how complex this, this issue is, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's time. It's so important to lean into this sort of complex intersectional frame of this issue. Um, it's it's going to require legislation, but it's also going to require the material recovery facilities. And it's also going to require, um, you know, leadership, local leadership to really put these programs together, do the educational pieces. Um, and then again, the national and regional harmonization of these policies. Um, there's a lot, <laughs> we have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, as, as you guys have been hearing, there's a lot to, 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 to do, um, but I am excited that we're having these conversations now. And I'm excited that um, more and more folks are recognizing that the climate implications of this work as well, so that we, we know that um, this is not a piece that we can leave out of the climate conversations. So yeah, I agree with what Sarah said. And then yes, I just wanna um, shout out the person who wrote in the chat that the lack of recycling programs that exist, that's a huge reality we have to account for. And some, I mean, some of that comes down to the fact, and we, you know, we don't talk it about it as much as we should, and we, you know, we used to talk about it more. But it's, it's effectively the cheap cost of landfilling our waste, um, and that is one of the, one of the biggest inhibitors to to recycling because it it does actually cost to collect recycling, and it does cost to process that material, and most of the time the market demand isn't there to en enable sufficient income to support. Um, to, to support the, the infrastructure we need. So we need to look at why are we making it so easy and cheap to throw our waste into a landfill site. Um, and, and that is not, you know, that doesn't, that the cost of disposing waste does not incorporate the environmental and, and social impacts of, of landfilling our, our waste. And we need to make sure that those costs include those externalities that are currently being ignored. Um, otherwise, we won't get the investment that we need in, in, the, in the recycling infrastructure or, uh, um, or anything else. And so fees that kind of, I mean, yeah, that make it more um, viable to invest in recycling is going to be is really a, a critical piece of the, of the puzzle as well and that's what was highlighted in the 50 states of recycling report that we wrote um, just about, about a month ago um, another question that we got uh, is interesting talking about these voluntary initiatives um, we've talked a lot about sort of meeting metrics and goals and things but now we have all of these also voluntary things like the u.s plastic pact 
And um, they're wondering sort of how are those impacting the policy conversation? You know, is, is, is there a still an, a big need for um, these sort of voluntary contributions? Um, is, does that mean that we don't necessarily need the policy? How do those two kind of interplay with each other? That, that's for both of you. Yinka, do you want to go first? Because otherwise I might be here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> I personally believe in statutory behavioral change. <laughs> I think that we need policies to drive behavior change. As great as it is that some people are sort of individually motivated um, to act on these issues, we have to recognize that's not go going to be everyone. And we the scale of this problem requires all hands on deck. So I, I have not seen legislators slow down in introducing bills because I think they also recognize we need, um, we need statutory behavioral change. Um, I also think that this really speaks to a sort of myth that we can individually um, address this crisis when the reality is we need huge systemic um, transformations to really undo um, the waste crisis. And so I think um, policies do exactly that. And, and yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, we, I think it's great that there is that the industry has come together and, and having a voice in terms of what they would like to see or, or, or think is necessary. And I think it's up to legislators to, 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 to view that, review that, and then in, incorporate that into, into policy. Because as, as Yinka said, we need everyone to move, not just a few players, otherwise we're not gonna get the investment and the and the, the sea change that we need to address the issue. And, and I, a lot of people will say, we've been hearing commitments in various forms for 20 years, and, and we have, and so now, there is a lot of momentum and, and companies are investing heavily in you know what the design of their packaging and what materials they should be using and so let's really hold them to account uh hold the industry to account and, and put that into legislation so that we we can we we know that there's going to be a, a positive outcome um and not a, a perceived outcome uh, i'm sorry if i haven't gotten to your questions yet um trying to group them together and we just got two similar questions about um to your points earlier about the cost of tipping fees, um, you know, how can these fees be structured more towards you know, recycling? Um, you know, and how can um, you know uh, waste companies be held accountable? I think for some of these costs, um, and you know, it, what what are your thoughts on um, you know tip fees currently, and is there a way to sort of you know move that towards? Um, a, towards recycling yeah i mean we think i think we have to understand what the cost of recycling is um and we need to make sure that the cost of landfill um doesn't undercut that um wh what we have to also be sure is that the cost of landfill doesn't increase significantly that it actually makes it the, the incentives there to have energy from waste or incineration because that's clearly not what we want to do and if you look if there's lessons to be learned from Europe is the fact that they had escalating landfill um, fees or taxes and that escalation got so high that it effectively become more um, viable to invest to in energy from waste which is one direction we, we really don't want to go in so I mean you can there are states that I mean I think it's not just necessarily there there's a, some states have obviously looked at banning recyclable material and some cities have done that as well. Seattle, for instance, you're not allowed to throw recyclables into your recycling cart. So there's, you can have the kind of disposal piece mirrored with a, a ban on and sending materials to landfill. The problem with when you're starting to do bans is that you have to somehow enforce it and who enforces it and how much does it cost to enforce. So there's kind of other issues around kind of the banning of, of materials to landfill. But we, we know that 20, 30, 40 dollars a ton. We know what it costs to re recycle, you know. We, we know that 30 dollars a ton, 25 dollars a ton, or even 50 dollars a ton to landfill waste is, is still going to be significantly less um, than, than sending it to, um, than, than, than recycling it. So we need to get the, um, we need to do an analysis to understand what the cost is and then and, and have an escalation over time to, to make it more viable to invest in the recycling infrastructure. I agree. Yeah, the, I mean, the states that have the highest landfill costs have the better recycling systems because it's actually you look to, you know, places in Washington and it's, it's prohibitive 
to send waste to landfill at $140 a ton. For $140 a ton, you can implement a pretty good recycling system. Um, you know, so we we know really where the price point should be. Um, and, and I think it's about, again, and, and having that in requiring an escalation over time um, within policy. I wanted to go back to a couple of questions that folks asked a little earlier that um, we weren't able to get to yet. Um, one, um, going back to some of the harmonization, there's a lot of interest in, in that. Um, this question is about um, either organizations or groups sort of leading efforts to harmonize some of these um, discussions in the Northeast in the US. Um, and this person is saying it looks like each state is kind of going its own path, which will frustrate harmonization. Um, can you both kind of talk about, I mean, what, what sort of happens when states kind of go their own direction? Um, what, you know, what's happening in the Northeast specifically, um, if there's anything notable, um, just kind of go back to that. Yeah, I mean, I can talk to the project that we're working on with an organization called Reloop Platform, um, just specifically on container deposit programs. So under that um, Reloop are an organization that have worked to progress legislation in Europe on single use plastics and, and deposit systems, as well as refillables um, over the last five years and have been very successful and are now um, through Elizabeth Bulk and their director in North America are trying to do similar things here. Um, as part of that, we've effectively got a group or consortium that has developed a set of key principles. So what we kind of want is like, what are the guiding principles that we should be speaking to states and legislators to um, around what should be included in, a, in an improved deposit bill, for instance, and the same could apply to extended producer responsibility. So what are those key guiding principles and why are those key guiding principles needed? Um, and I think that's, that's the piece, it's like, you can tell someone what you know we can as maybe policy experts or environmental you know people that have worked in the industry for a while what's needed but if you don't tell them why it's needed and, and what the if, it, if it's not included or if, if this is missed the impact of that then I think it's it, people will don't really understand the importance of some of those so I think what we're trying to do is develop those key principles to get sign up to those key principles and then, then there will always be some nuances across states because specifically when you're trying to like modernize an existing bill there's own you know transition may be may be different across different states but i really think it's important to set out what the key principles are and why they're important to the system and then to a certain degree let some of the the rest of it take more of a you know state specific um kind of nuances be allowed for i agree so um one coalition of folks that i would like to shout out is the break free from plastic network they're a global network that encompasses so many different groups um and they also came up with a set of epr for packaging principles um with the goal of harmonizing efforts nationally not even just in the northeast um and that was a fairly recent tool developed this year so i think in the coming sessions we're going to see a lot of legislators leaning on such principles and i agree with sarah it really starts with coming up with a set of key principles that um, legislators can adhere to or consider um, as they draft their bills and, and work on their efforts. So yes, the Break Free group, they have um, key principles for EPR packaging. And I think that they are great principles and uh, more and more folks will use them in the coming years. Yeah. And I think what you're finding is some of the industry associations like um, are also coming out with their key principles. So I think, you know, for us that talk to legislators, it's about looking at what those differences are, because it they may not seem on the surface to be that different, but they, you know, they're in terms of how schemes are funded, you know, in, in Maine, obviously, they're looking at, I think, to when we look at EPR, I mean, should producers only be paying for the recycling system? They should really be paying for the packaging that is end up ending up in the landfill because that's not where we want the material to go. And if you have a light, high landfill cost, then actually it's incentive for them to ensure the systems are in place to make sure that material is recycled, not actually going to the landfill. And a lot of EPR programs seem to just kind of concentrate on the recycling side and not necessarily look at what the packet, the, the amount of material that's going into the landfill site or in, being incinerated. So I think yeah there's there's nuances around some of these principles that you need to be able to explain but i think the, the outset we need those key principles that people can refer to um, as a starting yeah framework for bills uh we, we had another question about um infrastructure but this is specifically about uh the role of chemical recycling i know um a lot of times we hear about chemical recycling in terms of 
hey, this is an option for, you know, types of materials that wouldn't normally get recycled or wouldn't get recycled through mechanical means. Um, and um, uh, his question is, um, the industry argues that, I wanna make sure I'm, I'm saying the right one. Okay, yeah, the industry argues that compliance with these emerging recycled content standard requirements can't be achieved through just mechanical recycling and advocate for chemical recycling. How legitimate of an argument do you think that is? And is there a role for chemical recycling in this landscape? Okay, so chemical recycling, I mean, forms of chemical recycling have been around, well, since I've been working in waste management, which is a long time. <laughs> And they have never been financially viable and they continue not at the moment to be financially vi viable as a, as a system. Um, a mechanical recycling or chemical recycling needs a supply of material. And actually where we're failing is actually collecting material to be processed either mechanically or potentially later um, um, chemi chemically. Um, the cost of chemical recycling, if you think about it, is the cost of collecting the material, probably co the cost of pushing that through a mechanical recycling facility or a sorting facility to ensure um, that the outputs from that facility are sufficient to feed the chemical recycling facility and then chemically recycling it. And obviously there's the argument about when we recycle something chemically, we need to ensure that that material isn't going to be used as fuel, but effectively moves, it, it can be traced, which is complicated back into the supply of, of plastics again. So if you think about that supply chain, you know, it goes one step further than just mechanically recycling. It adds an additional value, an additional cost to the system. Now, we already talked about the fact that it's actually much cheaper to landfill our waste for, for $30 a tonne. So the viability of adding a chemical recycling facility for some of these materials is at the moment, the, the environment, the, 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 the economic environment is just not there. And it's only going to be achieved if actually those targets are very, very high. So we're not talking about 50% recycled content in plastic bottles. That can be achieved through, chem through, through mechanical recycling. Um, we're talking about if we're really pushing <laughs> recycling regs up to 80% maybe, um, and for some of those dif more difficult materials. But that comes back to the point that you need specific targets on flexible polyolefins. Poly you don't need a plastic target because a plastic target could be probably met by HDPE and PET. You need a specific flexible packaging target and then and if that cost is put back onto the producers they're going to have to look at where they invest and, and the and the value of, or the role of chemical recycling within the total system but at the moment if if a legislator is approached by a chemical recycler and says you know you don't need to legislate for this yet because we've got this technology that's coming through the economics isn't there to make that technology viable in my mind and therefore you need the policy even more to enable the environment to enable that that potentially that solution to come into play yeah, and i know i think at the state level there are a lot of um, chemical recycling uh bills that have been happening. So I'm curious what, what your thoughts are, if that's something that um, your organization has. Um. Yeah, so um, this is definitely a hot topic right now. We've seen a lot of um, policies proliferate and you know encouraging chemical recycling facilities and things like that under what I think is the guise of the circular economy premise. Um, I've seen a lot of folks say, you know, this is exactly like, circularity because it just you know creates more like plastic circularity when in reality I think going back to the framework of environmental justice climate justice we really have to ask ourselves first what is our end goal and if our end goal is stewarding healthy communities um, I don't think chemical recycling fits into that framework I think when we think about the toxic materials associated with these, these products of so plastic products, and then the process of pyrolysis, gasification, I think that that is not conducive to healthy communities. And where these plants tend to be based are again in black, brown, low income communities. Um, so we really have to ask ourselves what the end goal is um, and consider all everyone um, and everyone's health outcomes as we're thinking about these strategies. And um, I personally feel like we haven't even maximized the source reduction, refill, reuse opportunities <laughs> before we're going back to 
to these strategies like chemical recycling. So, um, you know, we all are familiar with the, <laughs> the uh, reduce reuse framework, right? We haven't even started there <laughs> before we're going into the recycling. Um, so let's start there first. But, you know, to be honest, my, my opinion is that uh, chemical recycling does not fit under an environmental justice framework. Um, and that is a very important consideration um, if we're looking for um, climate justice solutions to these issues. And I want to drop in a chat. Um, we work closely with the, um, the Global Alliance for Incineration Alternatives, Gaia, and they have phenomenal chemical recycling resources I think everyone should take a look at. Great. Well, we only have about six minutes left, but I did also want to get another audience question in this time about um, the focus on um, developing uh, domestic markets for recyclables. Um, I know that a couple of years ago, um, there was a big shift in, in the US about and in, in all over the, the world about, you know, what was being exported from our country. So um, his, the question is, um, how, much, how much of a focus should we be placing on developing domestic processing of recyclables and should there be incentives for businesses to address this? Curious what your thoughts are. I mean, from an environmental perspective, we want to try and make sure that, you know, the, the waste that we're producing is collected and fed back into products within the country, um, you know, that they're consumed. But obviously we are in a global environment and, and you know, you hear stories of recycled content or recycled material being shipped to another country to be fed back into products that are then shipped back into the US just so that uh, organizations can meet kind of their recycled content goals or, um, so it's a complicated issue. I think, um, you know, markets have recovered, are recovering um, at the moment and there's been significant investment from, you know, overseas inv investors as well as, you know, um, domestic investors in things like, you know, paper and fiber recycling in the, in the US over the last, uh, last five years. Um, and I, I think I, you know, I, I think we do need to try and, and incentivize and we can do that to a certain degree through the recycle content mandates, um, investment in local infrastructure, recycling um, um, infrastructure. I, I don't have much to add. I'll also admit that I have some folks in the background of my apartment that were a little bit distracting toward the end there, but I trust Sarah to cover that point. <laughs> well, in the few minutes we have less left, uh, I'm curious about kind of looking forward in what time we have left in this year's um, US legislative season. Um, what is maybe, if maybe both of you want to pick sort of your kind of outlook for the rest of the session and then what you think might be the, the things that will definitely come up again next year or, you know, um, things that might not make it through this year that are going to set the tone for the next legislative session. So I can start there. So I think we're going to see, we're going to continue to see the single use plastic bans. Um, I also feel like looking toward next year, um, we're going to see more refill and reuse policies. Um, I, again, I think legislators are recognizing more and more the importance of starting from the, the source reduction, reuse and refill point um, and, and coupling that with recycling policies. Um, I think the Washington bill I mentioned earlier is going to be a great example for, for other states who want to strengthen the recyclability of products and also tackle um, hazardous substances. So the PFAS and packaging um, issue, I think that's going to continue to proliferate across states um, next year, and it's still proliferating this year. Um, I think extended producer responsibility for packaging is going to be another topic um, we're going to see more states pursuing and continuing um, next year. And let's see what else. I also think that there is going to be um, movement on um, sort of the litter reduction strategies. One thing that we haven't talked about is, is like the balloon bans and things like that. We're also seeing a lot of, of those policies, which I think at, at, 
at face value may not seem as impactful, but they certainly are. I mean, when we think about the amount of balloons <laughs> released um, into the environment every year, um, I think we'll also see some, uh, another topic is international consciousness and resolutions. Um, we saw some folks in the chat talking about this. Um, so resolutions really um, acknowledging and addressing um, waste exporting and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, I think states are just going to continue the momentum they've been building over the years, um, and particularly this year. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I have much to add to that. I think, yeah, recycled content is going to be key in, in a lot of states. And um, I think one of the important issues there is like, how do we verify and measure recycled content in, 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 the, in goods when they, you know, when they're trying to compliance with some of that legislation, I think that's going to hopefully strengthen a little bit um, off the back of kind of the RMS standard that's kind of recently come out. Um, so I think that's going to be critical in, in, me in measuring, but I, I'd like to see that some of these, now we've got some momentum on some of these issues that um, there's greater consideration of how we're going to kind of measure and performance against some some of the um, some of the EPR and recycled content bills that are kind of being proposed. Uh, there was a, one question specific about the main bill uh, about if it doesn't pass, what sort of message that might send. Yinka, do you have any thoughts on that in our last few minutes? Well, I, I hope the question wasn't alluding to like if it doesn't pass, does that mean other states will not pursue EPR bills? I think if it doesn't pass, the the lead sponsor of the bill, who is an immense environmental champion and public health champion, will continue the momentum, um, and other states will continue the momentum as well. I think that we have entered an era of shifting away from single use and really working on zero waste strategies. So I don't see any of that movement slowing down, regardless of of the. Main bill passing or not passing. We're all hopeful for that bill. Um, and I think we're going to see even more next year. So really exciting time. Great. I think we're at time. Um, so thanks so much for this great chat. I learned a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Um, thank you, Inka. And thank you, Sarah. Like uh, Megan did mention, I think we all learned a lot. It's pretty evident in the chat as well as for the Q&A and the, to the audience, we're sorry that we couldn't go through all the questions. Uh, uh, let's hope we have another webinar on uh, a similar topic to help address all the leftover questions. So someone asked me if the recording will be accessible. There's an on-demand webinar. You should access the recording of this webinar when you go click on the link that you received on your email. In any case, the recording will go up on our website in two weeks time. So thanks a lot to everyone. Have a Good day, good evening, wherever you're at. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks, everyone.